you know, there's really no excuse there. Yeah, I, I guess I remember there's a picture, a, a famous picture, and I'm sure you know, of, um, I think it was Scalia on a boat, like salmon fishing and drinking, drinking martinis that were chilled with glacier ice, which was, which was a yes. little too on the nose. Um, so I, I mean, it's not like Justice Thomas invented ethical lapses, but he's, he's perfected the art, let's say. Yes, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good characterization. Welcome to Law and Chaos. Today, we're going to talk about Supreme Court ethics, if any. The extensive revelations this past year about SCOTUS sugar daddies have spurred a new push for binding ethics rules for the justices. And boy, are they mad about it. They're also pissed that we noticed their massive power grab to roll back two generations of civil rights advances and cancel any executive branch action they don't like. How dare you call them partisan hacks? We'll talk to Gabe Roth, director of Fix the Court, about what's gone wrong and how to repair it. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Hey guys, it's Liz Dye, and before we get to our interview with Gabe Roth, let's talk for a bit about the latest developments in Fulton County. We have an all-Trump show with our buddy Mitchell Epner planned for Monday because shit has gone totally sideways in Florida. Thank you, Judge Cannon. And on top of that, we've got a bunch of action in the New York civil case where poor Donald Trump cannot get a bond. Yes, I, I know, it's very sad. I'm, I'm upset myself. But last week in Georgia, Judge Scott McAfee denied Trump's motion to dismiss that case and disqualify District Attorney Fonnie Willis from prosecuting the plot to steal the state's electoral votes for Donald Trump in 2020. The court ruled that there was no actual conflict inherent in the DA's romantic relationship with Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, and thus her office did not have to be disqualified. But due to the apparent conflict, which might make the public question the validity of the proceedings, Wade had to go. And he did. He submitted his resignation just hours later, and it was accepted, which should have been the end of the matter. But it was not, because Trump and his co-defendants had the right to petition for immediate interlocutory appeal, which they did. And on Wednesday, Judge McAfee gave it to him, granting the certificate of immediate review. So now the defendants will request that the Georgia Court of Appeals intercede and disqualify Willis. I understand from our buddy Andrew Fleischman, he's a Georgia defense attorney, that this would likely stop the case in its tracks. But Judge McAfee seems quite leery of doing that and has has signaled pretty hard to the appeals court that he, he doesn't think that should happen. In his grant, he wrote, the challenged order is not one of final judgment and the state has informed the court that it has complied with the order's demands. That is, Nathan Wade is gone. Thus, unless directed otherwise by an appellate court, supersedious shall only apply to the order being appealed. The court intends to continue addressing the many other unrelated pending pretrial motions, regardless of whether the petition is granted within 45 days of filing, and even if any subsequent appeal is expedited by the appellate court. So there's some ambiguity there, but but he's saying pretty clearly, I'm not going to stop this case unless the appeals court specifically tells me to do it because the issue, I, I don't think that I need to do it. There's plenty of other stuff that we need to do to keep this case on track. There's a bit of ambiguity there, though, and the Court of Appeals has 45 days to accept or reject the petition. But, you know, look, it's a pretty big case. I wouldn't anticipate that they would take all 45 days. They, they know that the whole world's watching. Okay. If you are a subscriber at patreon.com slash lawandchaospod or on substack at lawandchaospod.com, you are listening to this ad free. If not, I will see you back here in a moment for my interview with Gabe Roth after we pay some bills. And with us today is Gabe Roth, executive director of the nonpartisan nonprofit Fix the Court. He's here to explain to us all the ways the state and federal judiciary suck and what we should do about it. Gabe, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. First question. How bad does the court suck? Well, it depends on which court, um, but uh, most of them aren't doing great, at least most of the the top courts uh, in our country that have the most power. So whether you're talking about state Supreme Courts or the uh, the federal courts and the U.S. Supreme Court, each individual court and the courts collectively have major transparency and accountability problems. 
Right. And, and when you say transparency and accountability problems, can you explain for the lay listener exactly what you mean? Of course. Yeah. So look, I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court, I actually got into this business of court fixing because my background is in broadcast journalism. And I was working on a for, with a, a, a nonpartisan organization called the Coalition for Court Transparency, trying to get cameras in the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are still not cameras in the Supreme Court, but this was back um, about 10 years ago. And there was not even same day audio releases of the oral arguments at the Supreme Court. Now, not only do we get same day audio releases, we get live audio releases, a uh, live audio streaming of all the oral, oral arguments. There's one happening right now as, as you and I talk on, mm-hmm. uh, on, on Wednesday morning. Uh, and that's a huge improvement. Uh, obviously video would be better for, for a lot of reasons, but you know, the fact that we get live audio in, in the U S Supreme court and in all 13 federal courts of appeals, uh, still four years after the start of the pandemic, I think is a major accomplishment. And then you know, most state Supreme courts have, have live streaming, but uh, there are definitely a few that refuse to do it, um, even during the pandemic. Right. We would never have gotten all of this absent the pandemic, right? Yeah, that's that's a good point, is that I think the pandemic helped bring a lot of these judiciaries kicking and screaming into the streaming age of like, you know, mid 90s or whenever that, that technology first uh, jumped on the scene. Um, so instead of being 100 years behind, now they're only like 30 years behind. But um, so that's really just where I got my interest right. in is that I went to, 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 to journalism school, then I worked in, in a local news station in Jacksonville, where your son is right now. And, you know, I, I eventually moved to DC with that same idea, but switched to the jobs at the last minute and started doing consulting. And then one of the clients I had, you know, was uh, had a Supreme Court case and, you know, they were not anywhere close to Washington, DC. Um, and uh, they wanted to, to see what was going on. So that's sort of the impetus of starting the Coalition for Court Transparency. And then it became clear that it wasn't just this live streaming issue that made the Supreme Court and the other federal courts and even the state courts so uh, opaque and antiquated and antediluvian. It's really more on the accountability level uh, in which the states of Supreme Courts and the federal courts are a total mess. So let me just back you up a second. To what do you attribute this reluctance to have cameras in the courtroom? Because it's it, it's not going away, right? There's there's absolutely no movement on that one. Yeah, I think I think a few things. One of it is definitely an age issue. Right. If, if, if the oldest, you know, Justice Barrett is the youngest justice right now, mm-hmm. if she were the oldest justice, I think we would have cameras in the Supreme Court. I think that when you talk about justices who, who are around Justice Barrett's age, so Justice Jackson, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Kagan, they, they, they would support cameras. I think they just sort of have grown up with, you know, their Generation Xers uh, mostly. They just grew up with television being ubiquitous. And, and when you get your next round of justices, and I'm uh, uh, Generation Y, born in '82, like that—that's going to be in the same sort of mindset of you know, television's ubiquitous. Like, you know, what what's the problem? But I think a lot of it is age, right? When you have justices, you know, up until recently, you know, Breyer was in his 80s, Kennedy was in his 80s, Scalia was 79 when he died, Ginsburg was in her 80s, and I think that there is this this mistaken belief that you know the Supreme Court oral argument is this perfect thing that is you know. We can't put, we can't mess with it. We can't change it. It's 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 such a, a an interesting and great civic institution that that bringing in cameras, as Justice Kennedy said, we don't want the you know invidious elements or insidious elements or pernicious elements into the mm-hmm. into the courtroom. And I, what I would say to that is one: oral arguments have changed a ton in the last five years. Justice mm-hmm. Thomas never used to ask a question in oral argument. Now he asks the first question in every oral argument. Right. Justices used to interrupt each other all the time. They used to interrupt the lawyers. Sometimes a, a lawyer would say a single syllable at the beginning of his or her argument, and a justice would interrupt. Now the lawyer gets two minutes to speak uninterrupted. Now Justice Thomas gets to ask the question. Now there's a round robin of questions after which there is a sort of a free for all. And that's made the, the arguments longer, and we can debate whether or not that's good or not. But our oral arguments change, things change, nothing, you know, <laughs> a few things stay the same. Maybe the, you know, the marble columns aren't going away anytime soon. But I think that it's it's definitely valuable to, to see the justices do their job. You can only, there are only 430 seats in the Supreme Court. I, the last Supreme Court oral argument I went to was in November. I was the 39th person in line and I had to get there at 4.55 in the morning. And there were only six people behind me who got in. So out of the 430 seats, there are only 45 members of the general public. I'm not an attorney. I don't get a special seat. I'm not a member of the Supreme Court press corps. So there are only 45 out of 430 in the room. 
that were part of the quote unquote public line, everyone else being either a journalist, a, a friend of a justice, a friend of a clerk, a friend of a litigant. Um, and that's or sometimes a school group, which is nice to see, but you know, th- those are few and far between. Uh, overall, that's pathetic that you can only have 45 members of the 330 million deep country see the justices in action. So let me ask you a question about that. Do you think that the reluctance is like they don't want to be on TV or the reluctance is they are trying to hide things? I mean, or is it both, right? Can it be both? I think it can be both. I mean, I think it's, I think they're, they're you know, what, what Justice Scalia once told the founder of C-SPAN is, is he's, he was worried about the takeouts, you know, the sound bites, the clips mm-hmm. that the then maybe John Stewart's now maybe John Oliver uh, of the world, or even, even, you know, on the right, there are plenty of obviously media outlets on the right would show things out of context. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we have newspaper articles in print and also on the internet that take snippets, takeouts, as, as Scalia called them, and put them in their articles. Or we have, you know, Nina Totenberg taking out a one, you know, sentence thing from, uh, uh, you know, something that Justice Gorsuch said and putting that in her piece on on All Things Considered. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, it's already happening. And having a video element is not going to change the nature of you know, the justices, how, how they sort of interact with one another on the bench. Like every single person, every judge I've spoken to about this, they say, yeah, you know, you're really worried on the first day when there's cameras in the court. And then 20 minutes into argument, you forget about it and you don't think about it again, right? It's, it sounds bad, but you got to do a job and your job is not going to be impacted. It wasn't impacted by live audio. Maybe some of the order of the argument of who's asking questions was impacted, but it hasn't, the quality of arguments has not been impacted by live audio, it wouldn't be impacted by video, and it hasn't been impacted by video in the Supreme Court of Ohio or the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom or anywhere else where there's live video coverage. Hey, you know what? I, I mean, from a personal perspective, I don't really think that that's a particularly compelling justification. Like, I don't want people to take what I say out of context when I'm doing yeah. my job. Like, who else would be able to say, and thus, you can't see it. I'm not going to give it to you. Right? That's that's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, that that's yeah. not a compelling justification, particularly for something so important to every American to say, well, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to, like, be on, you know, I don't want to be ex- excerpted on Fox News or MSNBC. Like, Toughen up, Buttercup. I mean, and it's an anonymity thing too. The justices used to love their anonymity and guard their anonymity, and they could go to you know the local supermarket and shop, and no one would know who they are. You know, or Justice Thomas would say, "Oh, you know, I once went to an, uh, uh, get gas at an RV station. You know, when I get gas oh, I at, uh, for my RV, I get to talk to the to the unwashed masses, and nobody knows who I am." I mean, first of all, it's bullshit. Second of all, um, everyone should know what their Supreme Court justices look like. And number three, like we are in a heightened an era of heightened security, and I don't want my justices just shopping at the grocery store by themselves. Like the justices, I mean, I've said this going back, you know, gosh, I don't even know how many years, but I remember I think it was right around the time Scalia died. I we, I did a thing with uh, with with some uh, some other groups. It's like there should be a secret a version of the Secret Service for the Supreme Court, and there is the Supreme Court police, and they're getting more security, but like. That's where we're at as a country in terms of the potential for political violence. So I want our, ju- you know, I want people to notice the justices, but notice the justices in between two and three security professionals that are walking them through this, the grocery store if they have to go, you know, if they don't have Instacart or whatever. So, you know, I, I think that those um, arguments of, oh, we just want to be an, an anonymous, you know, we're not part of the DC scene, we're not political players, has all, sort of always been bullshit. But, but especially now, I mean, you know, I, I want to know, I don't want the justices just randomly walking around by themselves. They should have the security. And unfortunately, for better or worse, security is, is conspicuous. So you're going to see that. Yeah, I, I take a slightly different take, which is like, it's along the same lines as my prior criticism, right? The, you are one of the Supreme Court justices. There's only nine of you and you have an enormous amount of power. And look, they're clearly, and we're going to talk about this in a second, in a period of arrogating even more power to themselves. So for them to be able to say, well, we'd like to kind of take away women's rights to control their own bodies and, you know, I mean, everything, right? They're they're in a period of seizing or reversing an entire generation of civil rights gains. Um, and, you know, to be able to say, I would like to do that. And I'd also like to be able to shop at Costco and nobody know who I am. Like, no, no, sorry. No. I mean, particularly, well, we'll discuss it in a minute, but since they appear, the only lever we have on them is shame, you know, sorry that yeah. it's embarrassing and people think that you're an asshole when you go out in public and maybe they protest you, but like, 
you know, you want to take away people's civil rights, they get a little testy. Sorry. But let's circle back because let's talk about the ethics problems here before we get to the problems of the the justices, um, the decisions that they make. Because the ethics disclosure issue is is one that's been really important in your work. Yeah, I, I have been, I guess, surprised the extent to which, maybe I shouldn't have been, but the extent to which certain justices have sort of dug their heels in and said, you know, look, I have done nothing wrong. When yeah. clearly you are flying on a private plane that is owned by a LLC or you're staying at a, a fancy summer camp retreat or you are going on a luxurious uh, Indonesian or New Zealand or Greek uh, vacation on a private yacht, you know, that that sort of is far outstrips the bounds of what you would as- assume a personal hospitality exemption would include, right? There is a personal in every federal judge and justice since, well, for about 40 years has had to file an annual financial disclosure report that says certain things. These are their investments. These are uh, spousal income. These are my uh, large debts. These are the reimbursements I got when I flew to the University of Virginia Law School or what have you. Mm-hmm. But there's a gift section and, 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 gifts, a certain type of gift has been exempted, right? If you get a, a, a Christmas present from your buddy, you don't have to, no matter, you know, you don't have to put that on your financial disclosure report. If your spouse, if your kid, if your college roommate gives you something, you don't have to put that on your annual financial disclosure report. And so that's the personal hospitality exemption. But there have been justices who have taken that exemption to the nth to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. And when you're talking about gifts that are so luxurious that the average they're out of reach for the average person of course you're going to start thinking about quid pro quo of course you're going to start thinking about corruption i mean the average supreme court justice the average federal judge would never go on as many private plane flights or private yacht trips or other luxurious vacations as justice thomas would and the fact that he hasn't you know, owned up to these errors and said, oh, you know, I received some advice that said that this was okay and I didn't have to report it. And I'm only, you know, when I've been caught, I'm only going to report some of it. You know, I mean, it it makes sense when you think about like, there's really very little the public can do to sort of change his behavior, right? He's not going to be impeached. He's not going to be removed. I mean, you could argue whether or not that's even impeachable behavior. I think there's an argument to be made on both sides, whether or not it goes that far. But it's definitely not legal, right? This is a federal law, a federal law, mind you, that the Supreme Court had an opportunity to overturn. There were lower court judges when this law came out that said, we're not filing financial disclosure reports and we're suing over it. Mm -hmm. And they lost their case in the lower court and the Supreme Court decided in January of 1981 not to touch that decision. So this is a law the Supreme Court could have overturned. It is on the books. It says that if you do not file your financial disclosure correctly – and you're omitting things willfully, or if you, we even think, we being the, ju- the judiciary's policymaking body, think that you might be omitting something willfully, we can refer this issue to the attorney general, and the attorney general can fine you $50,000 per violation. So that's basically the best way we have to hold Justice Thomas accountable is to, is to, to shrink the size of his, his bank account, which I'd be totally fine with. But, you know, yeah, there, there's just not a lot of, of levers that can be pushed on the one hand. On the other hand, as a public figure, as a public figure who is supposed to be trustworthy and unbiased and a consummate professional, this has been a very, these have been very egregious violations. And, you know, we need to keep watching this to be sure we can, it, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't continue to happen uh, in future generations of justices who clearly see Justice Thomas as uh, the gold standard in, in uh, the conservative legal movement. Okay, so let's talk about Justice Thomas, because he is the avatar of judicial impropriety, at least for the Supreme Court. There's been so many revelations about gifts that he's accepted, subsidies that he's accepted, travel specifically from a a conservative donor named Harlan Crow, who likes to have him at this, you know, conservative boys summer camp so they can, I don't know, plan plan the overthrow of, uh, of civil rights. You know, he's taken tuition for his child. I mean... Do you think that he is substantially worse than anyone else, or do you think that he's just the one that got caught? I think from an ethics perspective, it's it's worse than anyone else. I mean, every – and you can go to fixthecourt.com to check this out. Like, every justice has committed an ethics lapse or two, even Justice Jackson. I mean, she's omitted things from her disclosure. You know, Justice Barrett gave a speech saying, you know, 
the justices are not political hacks, standing next to Senator McConnell. Uh huh. That was that was amazing. Yeah, there's certain things we don't know about Justice Kavanaugh's finances and 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 Justice Gorsuch's. You know, he's he's real estate dealings. I don't think that he should have participated. I actually think the home sales were, pro- were probably fine, but I yeah. just think you know everyone everyone has a everyone's missed a recusal or two. Mm-hmm. But but yes, uh, Justice Thomas stands head and shoulders above the rest in terms of the amount of gifts he's received, the amount of things he hasn't reported, and sort of the just, you know, the reticence to realize that he is part of the federal government, which has rules about ethics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For instance, I believe somebody bought his mother's house and then let his mother live in it, you know, for the rest of her life. Like that's Harlan Crow. That was Harlan Crow. That's ridiculous, right? I mean, I don't think that that's an edge case. He he said he didn't have to report the home sale because he lost money in the transaction. Like, Like that's you read the disclosure regulations, and some of them are, are confusing. I get that, but this was not one of them. <laughs> you know, if you per, if if there is a real estate transaction that occurs during the year, you are required to report it on your disclosure, especially if it is uh, real estate that you own. It, right? If it's your if it's your primary residence, you don't have to report it. But if it's a secondary residence, you absolutely do have to report it. And you know, there's really no excuse there. Yeah, I, I guess I remember there's a picture, a famous picture, and I'm sure you know what. Of um, I think it was Scalia on a boat like salmon fishing and drinking drinking martinis that were chilled with glacier ice which was which was a yes. little too on the nose um so i mean it's not like justice thomas invented ethical lapses but he's he's perfected the art let's say yes that's uh that's a that's a good characterization <laughs> so what steps are being taken to remedy this problem yeah so some things are getting better and some things are getting worse i think on the the getting better front the judicial conference that is the policymaking body of the judiciary has made it clear that if you take a private plane flight, the private plane flight is not personal hospitality, and it has to be reported on your disclosure. If you are uh, staying at a luxury resort, unless that luxury resort is just owned by your buddy, and like none of them are, they're all owned by companies, LLCs, what have you. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're staying at a luxury resort, um, you have to put that on your financial disclosure, even if your buddy invites you to go stay there. So there's just a push towards greater disclosure, um, which I think is is helpful. It's not, you know, it's not perfect because there are still plenty of personal ho- hospitality exemptions that Justice Thomas uh, will probably claim. You know, last year he m- mentioned a few private planes that he stayed at, uh, that he flew on. But, you know, one of his trips to uh, one of Harlan Crow's events in Dallas, it mentioned his, you know, it mentioned that Crow paid for his transportation and his food, but lodging, which is usually the sort of the third and the trifecta of what's listed on a disclosure in that section, was not mentioned. So did Thomas pay for his own hotel? Did he stay at Harlan Crow's house? Mm-hmm. You know, I, we just don't know. Um, did he take why, his you know. subsidized RV? <laughs> exactly. Where, where was the RV at the time? So, you know, I think that that's, you know, and that, that's actually a really good segue is the RV, right? There, there has been nothing that has required you know, other than groups like mine agitating for it, require Justice Thomas to report the terms of this loan that he supposedly uh, received from a friend to to buy this luxury RV. I mean, this luxury RV cost, I don't know, quarter million dollars. Mm -hmm. Thomas paid a certain amount of it, of the principal down, but at some point the loan was forgiven. And, And, you know, we have the Senate Finance Committee looking into it, but he has never reported that loan that liability on his disclosure, which is a huge omission. You are supposed to report your liabilities. There's a whole section called liabilities. It's pretty obvious. And it's anything greater than $10,000. Um, and an RV, a 20, $250,000 RV is greater than $10,000. Yeah. Can I just interrupt you so we can talk about this RV? Yeah, because the RV is hilarious, right? The RV is part of the Justice Thomas myth, um, which he's actually had filmmakers kind of make to kind of puff him up as he's this man of the people. And he doesn't like to stay at luxury resorts. He likes to camp out in Walmart parking lots. He's just a man of the people. He and Ginny, you know, like sitting out there in their camper chairs. And it's absolute horseshit, right? He's got this super tricked out RV that costs as much as people's houses. Nobody knows you know, how he paid for it. Fueling it up and driving it is, you know, as expensive as a hotel in many instances. And he's, you know, it's part of his myth and nobody knows how he paid for it. And he's he's not going to tell anybody. No, he's not. There are members of the Senate that are trying to go after this because there are tax implications of 
having loans forgiven. There are tax implications of also some of the the Harlan Crow yacht and private plane trips uh, as well. So you know whether or not they get to the bo- the bottom of of it, we don't know yet. I mean, they're still working on it, but Thomas and his camp remained stonewalling, and it may you know never come out exactly the terms of this loan or all of the luxury trips. I mean, I've, there are a few other gifts that I've heard of um, that I'm trying to track down uh, that, that might come out in the next couple of months. But, you know, this is, this is a, an, an ongoing story, both in the largesse mm-hmm. that we learn of each year and the fact that, you know, we're not going to get the full picture because Thomas refuses to uh, what I would say, do his ethical duty and, and disclose. Right. And how old is he? I mean, he's, he's old, but he's going to be there a little. He's about 75, 75 right. or 76. He was born right. in 48. So he's not going anywhere. I mean, look, if he was, you know, if it was like, okay, he'll be gone next year, who cares? Maybe, but he's not going to be gone. I do think that the younger members of the court sort of seem to take this more seriously or are more sensitive to being shamed. They do not appear to have, um, they didn't grow up in a, in an era of opacity where there was this kind of bubble around them. They grew up in the internet era. They know that they're their behavior and their transactions will be scrutinized. And so they don't seem to have taken to this uh, this corruption like a, a fish to water. So let's talk about the judicial code of ethics that's been proposed and whether it's being adopted by the justices. Yeah. So in, in November, they did come out with something that they call the code of conduct for uh, Supreme Court justices. It mirrors very closely the code of conduct for the lower court, but there are certain uh, changes. So, just in general, the code, of, the idea of having a code of conduct. I mean, this has existed for a hundred years. The, it's been more formalized with some help from the ABA for the lower court mm-hmm. about fifty years ago. It's funny because the the chief justice, uh, well, there was two chief justices at the time. It was Warren and then it was Berger. But they, you know, they worked with the ABA. They said, "Oh yeah, it'd be great if the lower courts have this code of conduct." And then, of course, the Supreme Court never adopted it for themselves in, in the early 70s like the lower courts did. But you know, fast forward to today, and you know, there's been a lot of agitation to based on the Thomas scandal and, and the Alito scandal and even some things that Justices Sotomayor and other justices have done mm-hmm. to, to have a formal code, just something that the public can say, okay, this is what the justices are supposed to be doing, and we can sort of measure their behavior against. Unfortunately, the code is both incredibly weak, even weaker than the lower court's code, and it's not enforceable. So what do I mean by that? So it's weaker than the lower court's code because, and even weaker than federal law, there's a specific section on recusal in the code of conduct. And in federal law, it says that if a justice has these types of conflicts, A, B, C, D, E, a justice shall step aside Mm -hmm. from that case. It shall is a requirement in federal law. It's non-discretionary If you look at the code of conduct for, for the Supreme Court, it just says should. Should is a a gentle nudge, a recommendation, a mm-hmm. suggestion. This a, it's a, I mean, it seems like a silly difference, but in federal law, it is a very important difference. And the fact that they're using the weaker language to describe their ethical responsibilities is very telling about how seriously they take their ethical responsibilities. I think if you ask the justices, is the federal recusal statute that says ABCDE, as I mentioned, this is when you need to step aside from cases, is constitutional? I bet you most of them would say that it's not, frankly, which is disturbing in its own right, thinking that Congress has no purview over you know, their, their, their behavior. I mean, Congress can choose what cases they take, basically. The appellate jurisdiction, which is 99% of their jurisdiction, is all from Congress, but Congress can't say you know, don't be a judge in your own case. Don't hear a case where you're uh, where you have a financial stake in one of the parties. I mean, that's crazy. Don't hear a case where your wife is an insurrectionist and it has to do with insurrection. Just like as well, an example. You, you said it not me, but yes, that is uh, that is definitely something I was thinking about <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, so the code is very weak, and in terms of enforcement, right? So like, you know, just to to to, to give an example, like the example that you said with with the, sort of the, the January six related cases and Thomas's participation in them, and he's participated in almost all of those except one, the one that he didn't participate in. I don't believe he actually thought that there was a legit conflict. I just believe that there is, and I don't know if it's chamber by chambers or court wide, but there is some sort of keyword software situation at the court where if you're if you are name checked in a petition or in the um, backup materials, you're going to get a recusal notice. So Thomas, if you'll remember in the one eat John Eastman case that Thomas recused from, it was a petition. It didn't get accepted, but he recused it from that petition. Eastman's theory of how to get some of these 
bullshit uh, uh, 2020 election inter- interference cases at the court was to go through Justice Thomas, right? It was to file a petition yes. in the 11th Circuit so it would get to Justice Thomas. So I, I don't think Justice Thomas had like a re- revelation or anything. I just think he was name checked in the petition. And generally, when you're name checked in a petition, you recuse. I mean, that happens all the time. There are all these, I, I, trying to think of a nice way to say this, but mentally unstable individuals who, you know, think there's a conspiracy between John Roberts, Elvis's ghost, and Mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un or something like that. And, you know, they'll put in a petition and it'll name check Roberts and then Roberts automatically recuses. I think that's what happened here with Thomas. But the other January 6th petitions, he has not recused. He has participated in every single one of them. And there's no way to stop him from doing that, right? All recusal decisions are vested in the hands of the justice whose behavior is at issue. And you can't be, and I mean, the Code of Hammurabi said this, you can't be a judge in your own case. So there's no way to push him off a case Um, And even if you filed a formal recusal petition, which is a thing, the only person deciding that recusal petition or that recusal motion would be Justice Thomas himself. Mm -hmm. So when we say there are no enforcement mechanisms of the code, that is what we mean. When an ethical quandary arises, there's no way to take it to sort of the next level to see if there is reason for action on the part of the justice, whether recusal or not. That just doesn't exist. And there's, you know, ways that I'm thinking about and members of Congress are thinking about to change that. But as it stands right now, the code is just, you know, not worth the paper that it's written on because there's no enforcement mechanisms. Well, and worse than that, they appear to be so resistant to any kind of rubric or or metric that their behavior would be judged by that they won't even say when they do recuse why they did it or, you know, they're starting to do that, right? I think in the most recent ones, I think- yeah, two of the, it's, yeah. It's, I think it's Kagan and Jackson, right, are, are doing Kagan that. Kagan and Jackson say, you know, so so this is, I mean, this has been part of, law, like, this is part of a, a GOP-led bill in 2018. This is part of a Democratic bill led in 2011, 13, and, and, and 23. The justices should explain when they recuse. It shouldn't be this, like, big mystery. They recuse, you know, sometimes 200, you know, not from merit. Like, the justices get 5,500 petitions a year. They hear about 60 of them. Of the 5,500 petitions, about 200 times they recuse. And of those 200 times, maybe, you know, between one and four of them are on cases that are actually uh, heard, uh, argued of of the 60. So in other words, every week there are recusals that are happening at the court, right? There was five last week. They were all because of previous work. It was a, a couple of petitions from Pennsylvania dealing with prisoners that Alito, when he was on the Third Circuit 30 years ago, uh, heard, heard their cases. And then Kagan had a few from her time as, as Solicitor General. But, you know, Kagan, unlike Alito, actually said, I am, you know, not participating in the determination of this petition because of, you know, Canon 3C of the Code of Conduct. And you look at the 3C and it's like, you know, a, just, a justice can't participate in a case if they worked on an earlier version of it in a previous job. Very simple. Okay. Yeah. And you can look it up online. It's like, oh, yeah, she was Solicitor General when this prisoner first filed a petition. But with Alito, Alito's not giving you that answer. So it's like you got to go through all these archives on Pacer and elsewhere to figure out, okay, you know, was this prisoner in prison? You know, when did he commit the crime? I think one of them committed the crime in 1987. And Alito was a judge on the Third Circuit from 90 to 2006. So, okay, that that's sort of within the same time frame. And it's a real pain in the ass because it's just like, why are you hiding this? Just tell us previous work or just tell us you know, there's a case actually being ar- that was argued uh, yesterday. Today's March 20th, so March 19th, where it was a bankruptcy case, and one of the trustees was Boeing, and Boeing is a stock that Justice Alito owns. But to figure that out, because the case has been going through the federal courts, as a lot of these cases that reach SCOTUS do for 10 years, it's like impossible. It's it to even find Boeing in a filing took me forever. Just say I'm not participating in this case because Boeing was involved, and I own Boeing stock. And I think that level of basic transparency would be illuminating and would be helpful and would say, okay, well, actually, Justice Alito, there's another Boeing case that's at the court and you you forgot to recuse. So here, but we don't even know if we only know he owns Boeing stock because his financial disclosure, which, by the way, he always files those late and it's, you know, uh, they're not contemporaneous anyway. But still, it's like there's just these sort of basic steps that the court could do to open up to, to become more transparent. And time and time again, they fail to do it. 
Well, but deigning to answer the question would be acknowledging that somebody has a right to ask it. And they clearly don't think that anybody has a right to question anything that they do. And you can tell that by the public shit fits that they have over even the mildest criticism treating. I mean, look, there's been a lot of criticism, particularly from Steve Vladek, about the shadow docket, which is the the court deciding um, petitions without hearing, without a full, you know, full briefing. And, and they've done a bunch of really monumental things things on the shadow docket. We've had the Texas becoming its own immigration authority, which was a whole fuck tussle this week. It's ongoing, right? I mean, it's it's still, you know, right. before is- Right. They'll be probably by the time you guys hear this, we'll have been like another three iterations. It was a whole <laughs> thing this morning. But the Texas abortion ban went through on the shadow. Do- I mean, there's just all kinds of crazy right. stuff that's happening and they get so angry about even legitimate or or mild criticism from, um, you know, eminent practitioners. I mean, look, you've seen this. What do you think is the most egregious instance of this? Is it Alito? Of the of the criticism? Yeah, I, I don't think that it's a good look to go to the Wall Street Journal editorial board and your buddy who works there. Right. To every single time someone criticizes you to, to rebut that claim or in one case, pre-butt the claim because ProPublica was about to write a story about Justice Alito's trip and sent questions to the Supreme Court Public Information Office that forwarded on to Alito's chambers. Alito told the Public Information Office, I'm not going to respond, and then went on to have this op-ed effectively in the Wall Street Journal about you know pre-butting all the claims that ProPublica made. So you actually saw Alito's rebuttal, so I guess a pre-buttal, mm-hmm. before the ProPublica story even ran later that night. So in blindsiding the Supreme Court Public Information Office in the process, you know, that's got to be a fun pl- a workplace environment these days. But uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, what also makes it even worse is that one of the people that Justice Alito kept running to at the journal is actually not a journal journalist or even journal op-ed editor. It's a guy named Dave who lives down the street from me who argues several cases before the Supreme Court, including a major tax case called Moore versus U.S. back in November. So it's not it's not just that, that he's arguing just sort of these ethically dubious claims in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, but he's doing it with the help of somebody who has a case, who has you know, filed a case that is being heard, argued, it'll be decided by June at the Supreme Court. And Alito did not recuse in that case. And even, you know, wrote a four page missive saying why he shouldn't recuse in that case. So yeah, I mean, I I think there is justices always have the opportunity to give pushback, Mm -hmm. whether in their opinions, though they probably shouldn't do it there, but more in the general course of them speaking at colleges and universities, you know, the justices have a very robust speaking calendar. You know, we listed on fixthecourt.com where they're speaking or where they've recently spoken. And they, yeah, they absolutely respond to public criticism there and say, you know, oh, well, we, you know, we think we're working on ethics or we're trying to do this, but no one has been as strident as Justice Alito and no one has been as partisan as Justice Alito too. I mean, I think it's just, you know, we're sort of used to having these justices who fall into these partisan camps and this is just going to happen more and more, but I'm still going to complain about it. You know, he's speaking at FedSoc, he's speaking to the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is, which is very conservative, you know, it's not like he's also talking to the New Republic and speaking at, you know, NYU's chapter of the American Constitution Society, but he should be. You know, the, the fact that we're seeing these justices and these justices are only furthering this by only hanging out with one team, you know, it, it's, it's, we sort of have to take a step back and realize that it's, it's really not okay that our supposedly neutral arbiters of the law are doing such grotesquely political and partisan activities. Yeah, I I particularly liked Alito complaining about the um, Mifa Pristone argument about the the medication abortion argument. He was just whining and he he mispronounced the drug and he was like, I don't know why all these ladies keep coming to me with their Mipa Pristone arguments. You know, we have to (laughs) interrupt our work and deal with these emergency petitions like, oh, sorry, women's health is like interrupting your golf swing or whatever. I mean, he's just he's just a dick about it. But look, I think quite clearly the justices, particularly the chief justice, is rattled by the public 
perception of the court, um, which has declined so precipitously and which they clearly they lack legitimacy in the public eye, particularly because of some of the, you know, the, the abortion laws that they've done. They've, you know, overturning Roe was not a good look for the court. It did not endear the court to the public, particularly to women and it, and and their their wholesale rejection of precedent has has not made them look like a legitimate um, balls and strikes as 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 Justice Roberts would put it organization. Right. So like this week, Justice Sotomayor appeared with Justice Barrett to kind of say like, no, we're totally good. We're totally good. We hang out together. We're buddies, and this isn't um this isn't an uh, an institution which has been taken over by partisans and should be, you know, distrusted by the American public. Do you think that that's an appropriate thing for Justice Sotomayor to do, or do you think it makes the problem worse? Ooh, that's a tough question. Because, you know, it's interesting, when she appears just by herself, she does complain about how quickly the court is moving away from precedent. She does Mm -hmm. talk about how tired she is about all these emergency petitions that she has to review because the justices are just taking up cases sort of not in the normal course of things and hearing cert before judgment and all these sorts of really early stage issues that frankly should be sorted out by the lower courts before someone comes crying to SCOTUS because, you know, they drew a Clinton judge in the district court. So up SCOTUS will fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that Justice Sotomayor is definitely a gregarious and friendly and sort of gives you the benefit of the doubt and, you know, just warm type of a person. So it's not surprising that she would hit it off with someone like Justice Barrett, who, you know, in, in, in her own life has a very, you know, tight knit family and, and, and is, is, uh, you know, maybe not heterodox, but is someone, is someone who, you know, I think isn't necessarily on the same Gorsuch Alito Thomas train of let's overturn as much things as, you know, Abortion and and, and guns Mm -hmm. maybe being separate, but I think overall there have been a couple of Barrett votes that have been either with the liberals or have been, you know, maybe not as strident as, 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 as the Gorsuch Alito Thomas wing. So yeah, I think, I think she's, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a charm offensive on Justice Sotomayor's part yeah, because she does need Justice Barrett, uh, you know, if, if the liberals are going to win anything, she she needs two of three, uh, the three being Barrett, Kavanaugh and Roberts. And, you know, you can't alienate them. And if, if you know, I've, I've heard that some of the justices are trying to be, I don't know which ones, but are trying to be a little bit more circumspect when they appear in public, not always going to such partisan office, uh, places. Mm-hmm. It's a rumor that I've heard from from actually two sources. Um, I don't know which ones it is. But if it is Barrett, I mean, that makes sense that she would want to appear with Sotomayor. And it makes sense that Sotomayor would want to appear with Barrett because she needs her vote and they, they should, you know, they need to they need to get along. So, which again, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not saying this is a 3-3 court. I just want to be clear before I'm quoted, you know, taken out of a context somewhere yeah. else. This is obviously very much a 6-3 court, you know. So in 95% of the time, it's on things that you care about. I'll, I'll, I'll let my own political beliefs be sort of a mystery, but you know, on things that you care about, it's very much a six, three court uh, at the same time, there are going to be 5% of cases, 7% of cases, you know, maybe in a good year, 10% of cases where, you know, the Barrett Kavanaugh Roberts trifecta are not going to go along with a conservative project, either because they, they're going too fast or because it's just sort of out of the bounds of what the petition has requested. So I think that, you know, for those five to seven to 10% of the cases, yes, it makes sense that Sotomayor would launch a charm offensive against or or with uh, one of those three justices. I, I mean, from my own perspective, it looks to me like Kavanaugh and Barrett are rattled by the the delegitimization of the court, right? I mean, you could see that in the Colorado 14th Amendment disqualification case where Justice um, Barrett had her own separate concurrence where she was like, let's not be strident. We don't want to be strident, which is very funny as a, you know, as a woman in public who like expresses your opinion. 
people are going to call you strident. And she's like, no, girls, let's not like talk too mean about our men folk in public when the when everybody thinks that we're, you know, a totally delegitimized organization. And just last week, um, you know, Justice Kavanaugh was like, hey, dude, First Amendment doesn't work like that, it, you know, in in, um, in in the jawboning case. So let's see what you think, because obviously I think that the only lever that we have on these people is shame. But what do you think are the fixes that we could do to make this you know, less bad, at least at the, you know, at the upper level. Sure. So I, I think there, there are several. Some of them have been proposed in legislation. Some of them will be proposed in legislation in the coming weeks, I hope. But I, I think there needs to be, um, you know, more avenues for airing out ethics complaints mm-hmm. and more people in positions to look at and examine ethics lapses. So in terms of being able to air out ethics complaints, this is something that, you know, for me has has been disturbing for many years. But, you know, if you look at the lower courts, the lower courts have a law that says if a justice does something theoretically wrong or unethical or against the administration of justice, any person, literally, it says any person can file a complaint against that lower court judge. And there's about 2,700 lower court judges that this law applies to. I file, you know, two or three complaints a year based uh, a year based on, you know, things I see out there, political donations from judges, um, mm-hmm. still receiving a salary from your previous job, even though you're a federal judge, you know, being disrespectful to litigants. You know, I, I've definitely done this sort of thing uh, from time to time, but any person, right? I don't, you know, one of those judges in South Carolina, I live in Virginia, another is just uh, judges in Texas, where, where, you know, wherever they are. Well, a lot in Texas. <laughs> yes, several in Texas. That does not exist at the Supreme Court. There is no inbox. There's no person to complain to. I mean, mm-hmm. theoretically, I guess if you're, you know, uh, Senator Whitehouse, you could write a letter to the Office of Legal Counsel at the Supreme Court ahead of it, Ethan Torrey, or you could write a letter to Chief Justice Roberts, you could write a letter to uh, Robert Dow, the counselor to the Chief Justice or whatever, and maybe you'll get a response. But if you're mm-hmm. a regular, if you're me, or if you're a regular person, you know, you're probably not going to get a response. And there's even no like formal way to figure out how to how to do it or who the right person is. So at the very least, let's set up a system where if we think, you know, there is unethical, there's something unethical going on, just to, you know, uh, to give another example. Actually, no, I don't need to give given a million examples. <laughs> if you think there's something uh, unethical going on, you can send in a formal informal complaint to someone that will mm-hmm. then... Okay, so that's the that's the sort of the what, and now the who is. I, I believe there needs to just be a stronger ethical apparatus within both the the Supreme Court itself and then in the entire federal judiciary. In the Supreme Court itself, why is there no ethics council? Why is there no ethics investigation council? These are things that have been proposed in previous bills, one by Chris Murphy. I think there's there's some other members that are thinking about these sorts of things in terms of the who, and then judiciary wide, there is no inspector general. Uh, there's an inspector general in all of the executive agencies. There's, you know, an ethics committee in the uh, in in both houses of Congress. But there's no inspector general in the judiciary, a non-political, a non-partisan sort of separate person who could then disinterestedly review ethics complaints or ethics issues that arise during the course of the year. And maybe, you know, I don't think that person would be able to tell Clarence Thomas, you cannot hear this case, but they could write a report through mm-hmm. and through shame, you know, saying like, clearly you, Justice Thomas, are conflicted. And and maybe through shame that would that would, you know, affect uh the justice's decision about about recusal or about accepting trips or accepting other luxurious gifts. Again, ne- neither of these are perfect solutions. I think these are just sort of the, the building blocks, the very basic building blocks, because it is it is very difficult under the Constitution to say, okay, you know, Justice Thomas, you can't hear a certain number of cases. Justice Sotomayor, you can't hear a certain number of cases. Right. And through this sort of airing out of what these complaints are on a more regular basis or just having an inspector general that writes a report every other month or has an ethics council at the court that, that you know, puts out a press release saying these are all the ethics issues that we discussed over the last 12 months, I think would help move us in a direction of a, of a more accountable court. Okay. So speaking of accountable courts, can we talk uh, before you go? I have two questions and I I don't want to have you leave before if we don't talk about the judicial conference policy on judge shopping, because as we've talked about just for a briefly here, Texas is bad. The Fifth Circuit is really bad. But particularly in Texas, Mitch McConnell endeavored to install 
some really, really crazy judges in single member districts. So they're they're sitting in a place where they if you if you file in their district, you are almost certain to get these particular judges. And then they act as a feeder to the Fifth Circuit, which is wildly conservative. I mean, actually, I wouldn't call it conservative. I would call it captured by the right wing. And they have done all kinds of crazy things. So this week, the Judicial Conference proposed, or maybe it was last week, the Judicial Conference proposed a sort of a fix to allow more random judicial assignments so that there wouldn't be this you know, shopping, forum shopping, so that you can get in front of Judge Matthew Kaczmarek or Judge Terry Dowdy or one of these other wildly conservative judges who came up through the conservative movement themselves and are hostile to abortion and civil rights. So what do you think about this policy? And you want to talk about what happened after the policy was uh, put out? Yeah, I mean, the, the policy came out on a Tuesday, and it was announced by a very conservative judge, Jeff Sutton of uh, the Sixth Circuit. Uh, he's based in Ohio. And, you know, he, he said, look, you know, people have been abusing the system and filing in, in certain areas that they, certain cities within our country, where they know the judge that they're going to draw, and they may not have any ties to that city. I mean, you know, I think we're all thinking about the Mifepristone case, but there are definitely a lot of other cases, as you mentioned, um, where that's that's been the case. And look, you know, liberals have also judge shopped, right? Like, sure, maybe maybe not as egregiously, but you know, there was reasons that the Trump Muslim ban in 2017; those cases, there were reason they were filed in New York. Seattle, Honolulu, San right. Francisco. Right. You wanted to get in the the Ninth Circuit, but you didn't have quite like this. It wasn't like like and for exactly, the Mifa Pristone case. Right. For the Mifa Pristone case, this kind of astroturf religious group of supposedly religious like medical providers incorporated in Amarillo five seconds after Judge Matthew Kaczmarek was installed there. And, you know, to, to say, like, this is where we are, and thus we have jurisdiction in Amarillo to be in front of Judge Matthew Kaczmarek. And we've seen, like, Elon Musk does this crazy thing where he's filing all of his garbage lawsuits in Texas now because he would like to avail himself of the the judges that are there in, in the federal judiciary. So there was a there was quite a response to it, though, particularly in the Fifth Circuit. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the judges in the Fifth Circuit, several went on the record, and there was a letter from... Was it how? Minority Leader McConnell that was signed by, uh, I think, uh, Senator Cornyn. The Senator Cruz also made comments on this as well, you know, saying that, you know, remember, guys, you know, the letter said this, and then and then some of the judges like Jim Ho in the Fifth Circuit said this as well. It's like, remember, guys, this is just a guidance. This is just a policy. It doesn't supersede federal law. And federal law is very clear that says each circuit and district can decide how its cases are assigned. Now, technically, I Yes, that's correct um, in the sense that judicial conference policy in this case, I mean, if this went through the federal rules of civil procedure, that has the strength of law, right? Because that mm-hmm. has to be approved by Congress and it always is. Well, I mean, maybe they'd hold it up, but, you know, it's approved by Congress. And so that that's that has the, the, the strength of federal law. Judicial conference policy doesn't quite, I mean, it's sort of quasi law, but, you know, I think just McConnell and, and and Jim Ho and other folks putting the thumbs on the scale of no, we like the system how as it is. We like being able to game the system. So judges in Texas just you know keep doing everything as you want to do. So now we have sort of this tension of you know the judicial conference, which is very conservative, right? The, mm-hmm. the people who run the judicial conference are not liberals. You know, you have the tension between sort of the 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 Bush era conservatives who are like, yeah, you know, this is kind of ridiculous and unfair. Like, we probably should tamp down, and sort of the you know the the Trump era conservatives being like, no, just ignore it. Don't you know? Don't change anything. Is 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 unique? Is not unique? Is is interesting? And I think so. If Mitch McConnell says, well, don't do anything, change federal law. So you know, we need to call his bluff and say, okay, well, here are some proposals where we can fix this. And by the way, if you pass this now. This will help you out when Trump is president next year because you know that liberals are going to be filing in, you know, the San Francisco division of the Northern District of, uh, of California. So, you know, I think that it actually behooves both parties to, granted conservatives are more effective, but in the long term, behooves both parties to, to change this policy because, you know, I, I think liberals are, are paying attention right now and learning a lot from the, from the McConnell-Kasmeric project and, and will try to do the same thing should Trump return to the White House. Yeah, just just to kind of disambiguate that, Judge James Ho is a highly, highly partisan conservative judge on the Fifth Circuit. Um, he does all kinds of gross things like 
dead name trans litigants. Um, he, he's he's super gross. He well, he's bad, and he uh, he rubbished this policy because he likes being a feeder. He likes to have these judges like Matthew Kaczmarek to feed him cases like the the case that you know, like Dobbs and like the Mifa Pristone litigation so that they in the Fifth Circuit can write these crazy, crazy conservative opinions and, you know, dare the Supreme Court to reverse them. So they're saying basically, no, we really like to do this. We'd like to take advantage of these single member districts to roll back civil rights law and women's rights because now we have the, the Supreme Court. It, that's It's interesting to me that you perceive this as a, as a tension between the Bush era conservatives and the Trump era conservatives because because to me, the main difference between these, I mean, partly there is a fealty to the law, um, to the to the law as written, to the to the First Amendment. Like, look, we really do have laws, but partly the Trump era is a post-shame era. And Trump's judges function in that way, right? That they they don't care about being shamed. They don't care about discarding precedent. They don't care if we call them, we in the legal establishment, call them hacks, but that there is in this conservative kind of judicial firmament, a protectiveness over the judiciary as an institution. They are very invested. They particularly like Justice John Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, are invested in the legitimacy of the judiciary. And the Trump era conservative judges are willing to trade it for the win. Correct. Yeah, no, that's a good way of putting it. And that, yeah, and Sutton, Sutton, uh, who announced the policy, was uh, appointed by by W. Bush about uh, eighteen, sixteen years ago. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's a really good way of putting it. Is is sort of the that the tension between you know legitimacy versus win fast, win now. And I think the the win fast, win now is is is, is winning the day clearly. Okay, final question: Court packing? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't support court packing. I, I don't um, like that it's, you know, well, first of all, I just don't see it happening. Like, I don't think one day you're just going to snap your fingers and there's going to be 13 justices on the Supreme Court because Hank Johnson and Adam Schiff or whoever it is wants to to have uh, 13 justices. Um, oh, no, not Adam Schiff. Ed Markey uh, want 13 justices. I just I just don't think that's that's going to happen. Um, well, it will be know, Adam Schiff it, next year, but yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, he is going to be very likely to be a, a U.S. senator. Um, yeah, I, so so there's there's that. There's the sort of the practical aspect of it. The other thing is that I, I don't love the idea of, of raising the stakes. So, okay, we have 13 justices in 2025. Then we'll maybe we'll have 15 or 17 or 19 justices in 2029. And pretty soon we'll have 87 justices and the Supreme Court is pointless, which may be a good outcome, actually. When, you know, when, when you say it out loud, it might, may, may, maybe, so maybe that's one argument. I wouldn't use it, but maybe I've heard that argument, actually. Mm -hmm. It's not, not, not that new. I've heard that argument. The reason to support core packing is that it'll just, you know, neuter the Supreme Court. It'll be a mess of 87 justices and, you know, we can return power back to the people. That might be a convincing argument. I think, I just think it's a dangerous precedent to set that, you know, when we don't get what we want, we're going to run to the courts and the courts will fix it. I just think that that sort of mindset, you know, especially for liberals, maybe it worked during the Warren era, but for the other 200 years in which this country has existed, it has not worked. I think, you know, assuming that the court will, the court will save us, the court will, will be the bulwark. I mean, it's not, it hasn't been right. Yeah, you know, certainly you, not great guys. You got Obergefell, congratulations. But what else have you gotten really in the last however many, 50 years. So I mean, I think Bostock you know. is a good decision, and that was authored by Gorsuch, which enshrined um, some gay rights into law, trans rights into law. I'm not sure that that's going to hold, or it may become the Swiss cheese ruling that it's got so many holes in it. But for now, it is hypothetically the law. So I, I'm not sure that we got yeah. nothing. But let me talk about why 13, because they say 13 is this number that they say 13 justices because there are 13 federal federal circuits. But I, I think when I say that, I refute my own argument, right? Like the reason that we like it is we say, well, it's 13 because 13 would be a number that is anchored to some real thing. And thus, if we, if we liberals raise the state or, or raise the number from nine to 13, it wouldn't go higher, right? And so that's, but that's sort of, I think, magical thinking. We've all seen the number go to eight when it was politically convenient for Republicans and they didn't want to, you know, let Obama replace uh, Scalia. So I think 
I personally support it going to 13, but I do acknowledge that saying 13 as if 13 would be a magic number and Republicans wouldn't, you know, immediately make it 15 or 20 as, you know, it were it politically to their advantage. And and if they had the power, I think that that's probably a bit, little bit of magical thinking on my part. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I support this plan where you would have nine justices on the court, each serving 18 year terms. And, and to get there, it would take, you know, 10, 20 years. So you might have more than nine justices. And that how that would work is you have a new justice added every two years. And then if the current nine don't want to leave the court, then the new justice that's being added every two years might be the 10th or the 11th justice as Mm -hmm. we cycle through the years. So to me, just having a sort of regularization is what it's called. It's not a it doesn't roll off the tongue, but regularizing the appointment process, I think, would lower the temperature. So, you know, every two years, you're going to have a new justice in an odd numbered non election year, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd have a new justice, and, and that would, well, one, it would be a law that Congress passes, I, I see. So, I think it would sort of, you know, unneuter or re energize Congress to actually assert some authority right. over uh, the court, which I think it has under Article One and Article Three. But it would also say that, look, you know, the justices are not these all-powerful beings who should serve for 40 years untethered to any sort of ethical uh, mores. It, it's saying that, you know, justices serve for a time, not for all time, mm-hmm. and that they would that they would rotate off after a reasonable amount of time. And after the 18 years, they could do things like come back to the court if a justice died in year 16. I mean, if you had a, 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 an 18-year term of a justice who died in year 16, you're not going to appoint someone new for two years. You're going to Call up Justice Souter, who's been sitting around his house in New Hampshire doing nothing, still a justice of the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. or Justice O'Connor, if she was healthy for for a, a, a lot, many years after she left the court, and, and she heard cases on lower lower courts. And frankly, that's what should have happened after Justice Scalia died in 2016. That 14 month period between the time he died in 2016 and the time that Gorsuch was added to the court in 2017. There's no reason that Souter or or O'Connor couldn't have returned to the court if having an odd number of justices was so important. So. You know, I think there's there's a lot of different ways to to look at the the current crisis of, of trust in the in the in the Supreme Court. But part of the issue is that we have this view that these courts are these like all knowing oracular beings who mm-hmm. can never be. You know, we can never find someone t- to replace Ginsburg. We can never find someone to replace Scalia. You know, Justice Thomas is irreplaceable. That's not true. There's p- tons of lawyers, tons of attorneys, tons of uh, sorry judges throughout the country who could do the job. Right. And could do the job on a much shorter time frame, still long enough that they're not theoretically swayed by the politics of the day, but not so long as they, they become these sort of antiquarian nonogenarians that are just, you know, one minute away from senility, but hanging on until a president that they agree with is in the Oval Office. So I think term limits would, would fit that and court packing would only further politicize the court. Yeah, I mean, I, I I take your point that any kind of appointments that doesn't have term limits is going to have all of these perverse incentives, right? Like you have the incentive now to appoint justices who are in their 50s because, you know, and, and who are less experienced, like there are plenty of more experienced jurists on the on the federal judiciary, but you want to make sure that they're able to serve for 40 years. And so you, you have this you know incentive to appoint Justice Barrett, who's quite who's quite young, as as is um, Justice Kavanaugh and, and and even Gorsuch is pretty young. And you have the other, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the incentive for these justices to die in their boots because if you give up the seat, um, you know, then then you're going to get another Trump appointee and God knows that's a disaster. But I, I guess I would push back and say that's a long-term solution and maybe right now we're... Um, you know, maybe we have to think in a short term way because maybe we're like the democracy is at stake if Trump gets back in power or maybe <laughs> even if he doesn't get back in power. I mean, look, even if Biden wins again, we're talking about a, a 6-3 court that has made it very clear that it's going to arrogate an enormous amount of power to itself right now and burn it all down. Yeah, no, I I, I definitely hear that argument. I, I understand it. I, you know, I think... There are other solutions that I like, such as uh, jurisdiction stripping, using the power of the appropriations process to impact judiciary policy, right? If you don't have ethics rules, then sorry, you're only getting your salaries and your security. You're not getting anything else. You know, those are sort of my two favorite um, Mm -hmm. uh, guardrails right now. 
but yeah, look, I, I, I will grant you that I'm more of an incrementalist than, than, than many of your guests. And so, you know, it, it may not be the solution that, uh, a large swath of the country uh, likes, but the reality is, at least from my perspective, at the end of the day, you know, to, to pass a law, you need to have conservatives agree with some of right. it in principle, at least, you know, where we stand now. So, you know, for that matter, you know, that's why I'm working on sort of some of the, the smaller bore issues. Maybe that'll change if, if Congress changes or if the presidency changes, who knows? But yeah, I think that I'm a, uh, I'm more of a honey than a vinegar type of person. And and, and that's just, uh, you know, that's just my ethos. Uh, on the other hand, my plan and your plan, neither one of them is going to happen because. Uh, <laughs> I, I... That is the advantage of yes, that uh, we could say that this is just definitely a theoretical argument at the, at the, the time, hopefully in the not too, not too uh, distant future. It's more, uh, it's, it's less theoretical, but, but I agree right now. And, uh, March of 2024, it, it definitely is more theoretical. Yeah. Well, you know who has the balls to do it? I think Kamala Harris. I'm just saying. Ah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Gabe Roth. It is fixthecourt.com. You guys should go there. There is so much information, both on federal and state judiciaries, which we didn't even get to talk about today. But um, thank you so much for being here. I hope you'll come back. Thanks, Liz. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Raise to Media, LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney-client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenagle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Raise to Media, LLC, all rights reserved.